Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Could I have your attention for a minute? Can you all see me around the corner there? Good. Everybody could have a seat. I'd like to welcome you today uh, to this wonderful event. My name is Rich Fisher. I'm the president and CEO of Fox Chase. I've been here approximately a year, and a lot of things are changing, and uh, we're continuing every day to get bigger and better. And we can't do that without the support of a loyal constituency of which I'm pleased to meet you and thank you of supporters who understand the value of what we're doing and have contributed greatly to that. Uh, this group, and uh, I see Roberta and Tanya Stutman, raised more, led by them, raised more than nine and a quarter, nine point nine. I got to get this right. $925,000. I apologize for stammering that for just research. Uh, this is an amazing figure by any uh, measure, and we thank both Robert and Tanya for their personal advocacy. Uh, I know that uh, I've already spoken to them, and uh, they've said they wish they could do more, and I know that it is through people like you that they are always trying to do more and move this forward. And apparently Cass Roberts, who I haven't met yet, is uh, organizing a South Jersey GIST fund, uh, which is going to be uh, going on an event in the future. So thank you to that. Um, Fox Chase is really you know, dedicated to prevailing over cancer, and that means the whole range of basic research into translational science and clinical medicine. Uh, we, we've had some wonderful scientific accomplishments. Uh, our rankings in U.S. News & World Report, for what that's worth, moved up 20 rankings this year. Uh, we've had many of our physicians and scientists listed among the best in the area. Uh, we were listed among the 10 best places for postdoctoral research fellows to come and work in the country. So all of these things are great things. And we're expanding our, uh, basically, uh, efforts to many other people and places. We've just instituted a very new uh, plan that I started where we're seeing all of our new patients within 24 hours after they call in. And given all the things that are said about big organizations and academic centers and how hard it is to get in, we think that's a tremendous uh, achievement. And all of our faculty and staff have jumped up and really embraced that. Uh, in the first week we put it in, we saw 29 new patients, 26 of them chose to come in in the uh, first day. All of those patients are staying with us. And 23 of them went immediately into multidisciplinary care units, units, getting the best possible care. So that's pretty exciting. So a lot of good things going on here. I guess the plan is that everyone's going to enjoy lunch. I'm going to grab a quick bite with you, and then I'm going to go back to my other meetings and responsibilities. But many of my colleagues, Bob Beck will be here. Uh, and. Uh, you will hear from Meg and other people about the science that's going on. Once again, we thank you. We appreciate what you do. We know how hard it is, but we want you to know how we take it very seriously, and our stewardship of your activities uh, will be at the continuing high level. So thank you all for your attention. Appreciate it. I'd like to invite people to continue with your lunch. We'll be having dessert in a few minutes, but now it's my great pleasure. I'm Bob Beck, uh, Deputy Director at Fox Chase. It's my pleasure to introduce three people who will be telling you about the state of science in GIST and what's going on here at Fox Chase Cancer Center. And I, I had the pleasure of sitting at the table with people who are new to this event, and we're asking, you know, what's going on in the field and were any of the researchers here today. And so you're going to hear about three of them. You know, we spent the last year developing our relationship and our collaborations with Temple scientists. Today, though, it's three Fox Chasers. Um, and I'd like to start by introducing Meg Von Marin, who's going to produce, uh, pr provide an update on her research, clinical and translational research. Uh, Meg is outstanding. She is the queen of GIS. <laughs> That's not just locally. I think I, you know, she, is, she is the... She, she is the, na the national empress or que queen of the field. Again, uh, this year named in the annual compendium of the best doctors in America. Only 5% of doctors in the country are in a spot on that list. And uh, she is outstanding and has recently uh, taken a new responsibility at Fox Chase as 
the associate director of the Cancer Center for Clinical Research. Uh, so the entire clinical research portfolio at Fox Chase is uh, being administered by Meg and her team. I've been working much more closely with her this past year, and it's very exciting uh, to see her as a leader. She's been a leader in the field. She's now a leader at the center, leader nationally. Meg? Well, thank you, Dr. Beck. That was very nice. Um, introduction. So it's always my pleasure to uh, uh, be here and um, to thank Tanya and Robert and um, Julie and Cass and other members of the um, GCRF um, and all of you who come and make the time to come and hear what we have to say. Um, I am going to start by talking about some clinical research that we're doing here at Fox Chase. Um, and it's actually something that I mentioned last year that I said I hoped I would be able to discuss this year. So I am excited to do so. Um, there we go. So for those of you who have been here before, this slide may be one that you've seen before. Um, and um, I would say almost 10 years ago now, maybe not quite, um, one of the things that um, was really exciting about GIST when we first embarked on treating patients was um, patients who took Gleevec for their GIST, if you took a PET scan, which is a way of looking at tumors radiographically by using a radioactive sugar, they would, before they started, their tumors glowed, and then after they took their Gleevec, they would stopped glowing. They were no longer taking in sugar. And so it made us look at what was happening with sugar pathways in GIST cells. Um, and we studied things like the insulin receptor. Um, and another receptor that we looked at is this one, insulin growth factor like one receptor. Um, and you can see, um, for those of you who've never seen this, you're going to get an introduction to um, science. This is what's known as a Western blot, and those black bands are proteins. And you can see there are a couple of them that are highlighted that are very, very dark, number 10, number 15, number 18. Um, and when we looked at these that were particularly dark or seemed to have a lot of protein, it turned out that these were the GIST that didn't have the regular mutations that we think of in GIST. Um, so they were known as wild type. They had no um, known um, genetic alterations that we know of at the time. Um, we saw that not only was this true when we looked at the protein level, but if you looked at the tissue sections, um, my pointer's not, ah, you can see at the very top, this is, they both have evidence, both this one on the top, which is the wild type, and this one on the bottom, which is a regular mutation positive gist. Um, they both have lots of kit expression, which you would expect, because that is how we mark GIST in the laboratory and pathology lab. But they, the top one, the wild type, has a lot of this protein IGF-1R, whereas the other one doesn't. Um, and this was actually one of the first papers that, Mar uh, that Lori um, participated in um, when she first joined the lab. Um, and you can probably remember the year. Um, so this led, um, after many um, proposals looking at many different drugs to a study, um, which I'm going to share with you today, um, look, testing a drug called lincitinib, um, which is a drug like Levec, in that it's an oral drug, but it targets or inhibits this growth factor IGF-1R. Um, and so I'm going to share with you some of the presentation that I gave um, at a meeting called the uh, Connective Tissue Oncology Society meeting, which was held this fall. And um, in June, I will be updating this information at the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Um, so this uh, is uh, part of the presentation that I gave in the fall. Um, I'm going to, this study was done not only here, um, but was orchestrated through an organization called the Sarcoma Alliance for Research Through Collaboration, and they sort of um, took care of um, making sure that everybody had the protocol, um, sort of the uh, organization of the study, and then um, had collaborators at Oregon Health Sciences, Mike Heinrich, um, Scott Chutzi, who's at University of Michigan, uh, Christian Ganju um, is at Stanford, um, Dr. Yu and Yap and Dr. Ben Denabil are um, radiologists and they're participating in the study. John Wright is at CTEP, which is part of the National Cancer Institute, and that's where we got the drug. And then Suzanne George, who's at Dana-Farber. So like many things, it takes a village to, to do anything, um, and these are part of the village that uh, participated. Um, so as a background, um, 
for um, the presentation, I reminded everybody that these wild type gists are not as responsive to regular uh, drugs like Gleevec. Um, and so there really is a need for new approaches for these patients who have this. Um, and we had identified that this receptor IGF-1R is expressed <coughs> on these wild type tumors. And so we proposed that if we tried to inhibit this pathway, that we might inhibit the growth um, or um, slow down how these tumors um, uh, developed. Um, and so this study um, was conducted um, in a group of patients that were put into two different strata, two different groups. One we called the pediatric group, and those were patients whose tumor was diagnosed before they were 18 years of age, or who had a type of gist known as carny triad or carny stratakis dyad. And I'll tell you what those are in a little bit. Um, and then there were those who were older than 18, but who didn't have any mutations. And for the different groups, they'd had to have certain prior studies, prior drugs um, treatment. So it wasn't, this wasn't their first treatment. The drug we used was lincitinib, and that was taken um, twice a day for 28 days continuously. Every 28 days, we considered a cycle. And we were looking to see whether or not patients responded based on decrease in size of the tumor, and then also how long their disease stopped growing, and other endpoints like how long they lived, how long um, we saw <clears throat> uh, they um, had uh, until their cancer got worse. This study had more women than men, and that's actually common in when we look at wild-type tumors. There are more girls or young women or females who are diagnosed with wild-type than there are men. Um, in general, patients who have this type tend to be younger. The average, if you look, uh, the average just patient, patient is usually diagnosed around the age of 60, um, and if you look at the clinical trials, that, that's the sort of the average age. In this study, the average age was 41. Um, there were six patients who fell into the pediatric type tumor, with two having the carny triad, with it I'll tell you about. Um, there, most of them had tumors that started in the stomach, and that's very common in patients who have wild type tumors. Many of them had disease that moved to other organs, into the liver or parts of their um, abdomen or to lymph nodes. And most of them had had other therapies, the average patient having had three, patient, three prior therapies, but some up to seven. So how long did these patients stay on study? And this um, information that I'm sharing with you um, is true as of September 30th. So there is more information, but I don't have it yet. Um, I'll be preparing for the ASCO presentation in about a month. Um, and I don't know that you can see so well. The ones that are um, lighter are in the blue and the pink um, are the patients who had stopped treatment because their cancer had gotten worse. So you can see um, there were fewer men, but the majority of men, the treatment had stopped working, um, whereas in women, it seemed like it worked better for longer. If you looked at where it started, again, patients who had stomach tumors, which were most of them, seemed to do better than patients who had diseases elsewhere. In particular, um, we looked at small bowel because there was the feeling that patients who developed wild-type tumors from the small bowel might have a very different biology. And Maybe so, but um, at this point, um, uh, it's hard to say because of the small numbers. When we looked at how patients were doing, there were, at the time that I looked at it, at the end of September, there were 15% of patients who had been on the drug for more than nine months. Um, an additional 55% had been on for at least six months, um, and then uh, there were additional patients who had just started um, and at the time, uh, there was also one patient who had been on for more than four months. So a fair number of patients who had been on for a long, long time um, for um, a study. What was disappointing was that we didn't see what we considered a response based on the criteria that we used to measure. Um, we consider a response anything that shrinks by more than 20%. And we had a couple of patients who got close, but not quite. And I have to say, this last patient here is a patient that I treated who um, went, uh, had to have surgery for another reason, and unfortunately never sort of get, got back on the study. And I always wonder what would have happened if he had been able to get back on the study, um, because I sort of had a feeling every time we looked, his tumor was getting smaller, it was getting smaller. So, um, but we won't have the opportunity to find that out. We did see some patients who had terrific meta metabolic responses, or what we see on the PET scan. And so these are sort of the pretty pictures that you can see. Before you started, this patient had 
um, the, you can see here in the colors, all that red is the tumor in, actually in this patient's liver. And these are two other ways of looking at it. And then eight weeks later, you can see that red is all gone. A lot of this dark stuff, the other way of looking at it is all gone. So clearly, um, this patient's tumor was being affected and not um, uh, being as metabolically active, no longer growing and dividing as quickly. Um, at least that we, we think that what that means. Um, this is information on how patients were doing um, in terms of progression. Um, and at six months, over half of the patients, 70% of the patients were still receiving their treatment. And um, for overall survival, um, that was um, over 85% were still um, alive and doing well. So I concluded at the end of this talk that in general this drug is well tolerated. I didn't go through all the toxicities, but in general, not a lot of side effects. Um, we didn't see real tumor shrinkage, um, although some large proportion of patients who've been on the drug for six months or longer, over half of the patients. Um, and then lastly, we did see some PET responses, and then there are some other studies that Marty and Lori have been involved with, as well as some other collaborators um, that um, hopefully we'll be able to have all pulled together to present at ASCO. I mentioned that, you know, the wild type gist and what these different types are. The Carney triad um, was described by a, a, a pathologist at Mayo Clinic, and he initially called it liomouse sarcoma, but we now know it's gist. But it comes with a uh, pulmonary chondromas, which are nodules in the lung, which are um, benign, although they can um, take up a large part of the lung. And then paragangliomas, which can be benign, but they sometimes can be malignant, but they involve um, neural tissues or um, adrenal glands. Um, and so he first described this. Um, and then along with uh, actually a student of his, uh, Dr. Chitakis, um, described a subsequent syndrome, which conclude, contains GIST and then paragangioma. And these two are different in that this last one, the, the syndrome, the dyad, um, there is a mutation that's been found. Um, and actually, that mutation sort of links all of these um, three types together. Um, and that was in a gene called SDH. Um, and these tumors, it turns out, lose the expression of this protein, SDH. Um, and so that's a way that you can test for it in the laboratory or in the pathology lab by looking for expression of it. And if it's lost, um, then it probably is one of these types of tumors. Um, the reason that's important or why this deficiency um, affects people, normally the SDH genes, and there are four of them, form a complex that all work together inside the mitochondria. And if any of you remember your basic biology, the mitochondria is sort of the workhorse or the powerhouse of the cell where it makes energy. Um, but this falls apart, and which leads to um, changes in what's supposed to happen. And I won't go through the, all the details of the pathway, but ultimately what happens is that Genes that are involved in um, things like making new blood vessels or growing or dividing um, get um, told to uh, continually do their function. So these cells are always telling their surroundings to make new blood vessels um, and also to grow and divide. And so this is the way that these tumors really are, um, have their cancer, why they, are, they behave like cancers, um, because of this pathway. Now, this pathway is linked to what we had initially described, the IGF-1 receptor, because the patients that have um, the loss of SDHB have high IGF-1R. So we think that IGF-1R, this receptor is one of the genes that gets turned on, and that's why or it is uh, on these cells at such high levels. Um, it's not true in the case in tumors that have that and uh, don't have this um, loss and are not wild type, usually. There's also another thing um, that has been found, and this was work um, done at the National Cancer Institute um, actually grown, that grew out of the NIH wild type clinic. Um, and they studied these um, tumors and found that if you looked at tumors that had lost the SDH, they had a change in um, what's <laughs> called methylation. And that's another way for cells to control whether a gene is doing its function or not. If it's methylated, it'll tend to not do its function. If it's not methylated, it will, or alterations. And so it's a way that with this um, loss of SDH that they can sort of control what genes are active and not. And another way, even if there's not a genetic change, that this pattern, um, these cells can be, grow and divide and um, have abnormal behavior like a cancer cell. So 
in thinking about how you could better treat these patients, um, you know, certainly other pathways might be important that are upregulated and you might be able to target them and VEGF receptors is one. Um, and there's a study that's going on or just being initiated at the NCI, the National Cancer Institute, that is targeting, targeting that using a drug called vendetinib. Um, Another approach would be maybe can we target this altered methylation? Um, and Dr. Beck mentioned our colleagues at Temple, um, and there is actually um, a, a scientist there who does a lot of studies on methylation, and he and I have started talking about whether or not we could do a study um, using that type of treatment in this group of patients. Um, and then lastly, something that we've been interested in and Marty will talk a little bit about um, is the immune system. And there are various studies from various labs that have suggested that the immune system can play a role in um, treatment of GIST, not only um, SDH deficient GIST, but all GIST. Um, in currently, um, I have a proposal into the National Cancer Institute to see if we could do a study which would combine Gleevec with an immune modulator um, and see if we can get better um, treatment outcomes for patients. Uh, thank you, Megan. I re reiterate all our gratitude and thanks for uh, those of you who uh, come to these events and support our efforts. Um, so that's me. And here we go. Um, so. Actually, I'm involved kind of, uh, these are the three major projects I'm involved in right now, and I'm going to give you a, uh, just a kind of a couple slide summary of uh, each of these uh, three projects. They all uh, have to do with uh, molecular analysis and GIST, and they give at least a nod towards this idea of, you know, personalized information about pe uh, 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 people's tumors and then uh, personalized therapy. So uh, th there's some... Um, uh, abbreviations here I guess I'm going to go through with you. Um, the first project has to do with investigating uh, serum levels of these insulin-like growth factor family proteins. I'm just going to abbreviate that IGF, that makes it easier. Uh, and these are the correlative, uh, correlative molecular studies that uh, Meg mentioned from the, from the SARC trial there for wild-type GIST. Um, the second project has to do with this uh, immune system mod modulation. And in this project, uh, right now I'm in, in investigating the expression levels of certain proteins called natural killer cell receptors or NCR receptors in GIST patients. And I have some help here with uh, Marion Campbell, or Marion Cole and uh, Kerry Campbell. And um, kind of a project I've been involved with in a, in a, for several years is this deep sequencing project of wild type GIST. If any of you have been here before, uh, you've certainly seen me talk about this. Uh, and this is in collaboration with uh, Biao Lu and our uh, CGI here. And uh, we have some collaborators out in Kansas as well, and some funding from the Sarcoma Foundation. So um, serum levels of IGF protein. So I'm just going to give you in each case uh, what the study samples are, kind of what the focus and what our main questions are. And then there'll usually be some pictures popping up here. So the study samples involve um, serum draws from those uh, patients from the trial, uh, taken at uh, anywhere from two to six different time points. Uh, we have uh, 20 patients, uh, and of course all these patients were treated with the uh, inhibitor uh, for the IGF-1R. Um, there's 86 serum uh, samples uh, to date, but uh, some of the patients are still in the trial and there will be more and I'll just give you a, a kind of an update on our work. The focus then is protein, uh, the amount of these proteins that are circulating in patients' uh, bloodstreams. So um, we are actually looking at, I, at these two uh, growth factors themselves, IGF-1 and IGF-2, and then proteins that bind to those growth factors that are called binding proteins, IGF BP uh, 1 to 7. So there's a total of nine biomarkers there that we're looking at, and I've completed six to date. And the main questions um, are, we're kind of interested whether these protein levels in uh, the bloodstream will change during the course of treatment because you're interacting with this IGF pathway, as well as correlating the uh, individual protein levels with clinical outcomes, such as response, progression-free, and overall survival. Okay, so here's a picture probably cannot see that in the back, but basically to emphasize the fact that the receptors themselves that are being targeted 
are on the cell membrane of the tumor cells. But throughout the patient's bloodstream, we have circulating up to uh, uh, two, two growth factors and seven binding proteins. Um, yeah, here we go. Uh, so the idea of the, uh, of the drug is to inhibit the receptor itself on, tumor, on the tumor cell membrane and uh, to see if that will impact tumor cell growth. So these other factors, however, interact with the receptor or with each other. So it's good to have correlative information about the patients in terms of the levels of these other uh, accessory proteins. So um, the technique we used, and I think Lori is going to talk about some ELISAs as well, is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. That's why we call it ELISA. And it's a, actually what's called a sandwich ELISA. These actually have been around for a while. Um, uh, but basically what you have actually downloaded the simplest picture I could from the internet, uh, and that's this diagram here. The basic idea, however, is that you have two proteins here and here. They're called antibodies. They interact, bind to specifically each IGF. So you got lots of proteins circulating in the bloodstream. You need some kind of specificity there. Now, one of the uh, antibodies uh, is attached to a piece of plastic, and then the other is put in in solution. And there's this whole series then of protein to protein interactions of a fairly high degree of specificity. Here's your IGF. It's called sandwich because these two antibodies both sandwich around the same factor that we're looking for. Uh, at the end is an enzyme. That's why it's called enzyme linked. And this enzyme con converts a substrate from a colorless to a colored substrate. And every, anytime we get color, we can measure the color, and so we get this signal detection, and then we can um, put a number to it. We can quantitate it, okay? So this is <laughs> taken with a high-tech instrument, my iPhone here. Uh, <laughs> so this is the latest one I did. It's actually not the best discrimination in terms of uh, the range of colors here, but what you have in here is a series of standards. So this was IGF binding protein seven. Uh, arranged in uh, order of concentration from high to low. We just dilute it as we go down. And then we put the individual samples here. Remember, there's about 86 of these samples, ultimately, that we look at. Okay, so now we, we have that. We can create a curve, standard curve, from these standards, where we have known concentrations and we plot it against what's called the absorbance. Okay, so it's just a level of color in the samples. And this is just one example of the data that we've accumulated for all the available samples. Uh, each different color is a different patient. They're just called series one to 21, actually, and uh, plotted over time. So we have about six sets of these already, um, and the, they haven't been seen by a statistician yet to uh, be able to answer those questions that we're interested in, which is, uh, are, is there any correlation between the patient's response and um, their levels and their changes in levels. So that's um, the first project. Uh, the second project is these um, natural killer cell receptor isoforms in just patients. So again, the study samples here now, we switch to uh, fox chase uh, patient samples that we have pulled out, uh, peripheral blood samples actually, from patients who were treated with imatinib. And the focus is on the RNA levels of these receptors. And I'm going to show you a little bit of that in a second. Um, the, these uh, receptors are uh, on the surface of specific immune cells in the, in the patient's circulating blood. And these are the NCRs. So the main question that we have here is, uh, do the levels of these specific receptor isoforms correlate with patient outcomes? So this is a little bit detailed here. I put isoforms in yellow there because I need to explain that when we get to the, I think, the next slide. Uh, this is just a picture, again, from the internet, uh, of a natural ki killer cell here identifying and latching on to a much larger tumor cell. And then in the next slide, uh, the tumor cell has been killed, lysed, uh, by the natural killer cell. So some of this is thought to be mediated by these NCRs, by these specific proteins on the surface. And some of the NCRs are thought to be uh, immunostimulatory or immunoinhibitory. Did that right? Okay. And so the isoforms I promised to explain a little bit. 
So this is all actually one gene, the NCR3 gene. I'm just going to show you the data for that one. And the NCR3 gene has three known isoforms. Uh, each, um, each isoform is made of these little cassettes here that are in pink. They're called exons. They create uh, the final protein. If you notice, they all have the same exon one, two, and three. But then the three isoforms, A, B, and C, are, uh, they use a, a different or an alternative exon four. Okay, so they're from the same gene, but they are different forms of the same uh, gene. Three different, ultimately three different proteins. Um, the next slide, uh, that's probably not too visible, but I tried to slide up here some color here, blue, green, I don't know what that is, red, uh, for the three different exons. So the fact that these genes um, and these the ultimate RNAs and proteins that, that they make uh, have a different um, exon four allows us to get specificity for picking those out and for quantitating those. So this is how that works, and these are TACMAN primer probes. And each one I'm trying to show you that in pink is a common, what's called a primer, for all three of them. And then these different colors is a different specific primer that um, uh, will identify A versus B versus C. So again, we do this uh, quantitative arc, uh, real-time PCR. You're going to get a number which is going to be related to the expression level of these uh, uh, RNAs and we would like to correlate these to progression and other types of uh, outcomes. So, so far, let's see if this comes up. Uh, we've had our uh, uh, stat person, um, Karthik, uh, look at these. And ultimately, what he has done here is for, I think, overall survival, and then in the next slide, progression-free survival, divided the three isoforms, A, B, and C, up into the top median, uh, the top half and the bottom half of expression level and try to see if these curves would separate uh, based upon the expression levels. And although we get a little bit of separation here for overall survival, and I think for progression-free survival here and here, um, at this stage, we, um, the p-values or the uh, probability values for these uh, are not yet significant. So that's where that project stands. And then finally, the deep sequencing of wild-type gists. Um, so may refer to these uh, patients uh, whose tumors we don't necessarily know the uh, initiating or subsequent uh, molecular changes in them. So in this case, we have study samples. I have not matched tumor and normal pairs from seven wild-type gist patients. Um, the focus is to identify DNA mutations in DNA that encodes these 20,000 human proteins. So this is a much bigger project looking not at one protein family, but at, at all the protein families. That translates to over 30 million bases of what's called the exome. So our main questions here are uh, identified, to identify these mutations, to validate them in larger sample sets, uh, to, mo to model the, the uh, mutations at the molecular level, and we have some help here with our molecular modeling group, and then to do functional studies to determine the effect of these mutations in cell lines. And we have some new funding uh, for this project here. Well, this really can't be seen, but that's okay. I, I didn't uh, intend for you to <laughs> see. Uh, this is, uh, so far, we're almost completed this sequencing, and we've got many, many mutations that we've identified. I think there's about 40 here. Uh, we feel like we're missing some, and you don't need to read these anyway. Uh, and that's great, because you can't. Okay, so there's one here, for example. Sometimes this is easy. We have this max transcription factor mutation in which two-thirds of the protein is actually lost. So this kind of mutation is easy. We know that this is del a deleterious mutation and of, so of some interest. In fact, this is a known oncogene which is mutated in some of those paragangliomas that uh, Meg mentioned. So we're trying to examine this gene, look for other mutations or loss of protein expression uh, in, uh, in other uh, GIST samples. So that's one example. Second example is a protein, it's also a, a transcription factor and thought to be an oncogene, um, where the mutation is a little more subtle. It just changes one amino acid to another. It's this Q257L. And the mutation is here, uh, and this protein binds to and activates transcription from DNA, shown with a double helix here. It's very close to the binding area, so we're going to ask our 
um, molecular people, to, uh, modeling people to take a look at that. And then the third thing, I'm, and last I'm going to mention, is this regulation of uh, this paper that came out on this gene that we found mutated in one of our cases as well. And this uh, paper describes how the effect of knocking out this gene uh, on prostate cancer cell growth and actually provides a mechanism for this. So now we, we now have with this cell line a model system for testing this gene function and we're um, currently uh, changing or manipulating levels of both the wild type and mutant proteins in these cells and looking to test the growth. So this is kind of a three-part summary, which you could read it, and um, that summarizes my talk, and I just want to say thank you. You can even come up and ask what a gene is, and we'll, we'll, we'll start from there. That's uh, right. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so just bear with me, just a few more minutes of science talk, and then we can have our cake and dessert. <laughs> Um, so again, my gratitude for all of you for taking the time out of your day to be here with us and to, to celebrate our efforts. Um, I know many of you probably in this room know firsthand how Amatnib or Gleevec has revolutionized the treatment of GISTs. But what we're also beginning to realize over the last few years is that resistance is becoming a reality and an increasing problem. So, my efforts in the lab have been focused um, recently on searching for mechanisms of imatinib resistance in GIST. And so I'll probably call it imatinib. It's the same thing as the Gleevec that you're, um, some of you may be taking. So in kind of dividing that large research project, I thought about kind of two immediate goals of my work. Um, the first is to find and then to ultimately validate markers of response to Gleevec. Um, thinking about if we can identify these markers in patients that, you know, maybe we can predict which patients will respond and do well on imatinib and those that may fail. And so hopefully in the future, as this group is translational, um, these efforts can eventually lead to potential changes in therapy um, for those patients that may and may not respond. And then secondly, as we start to get hints on new targets um, from a lot of the genomic studies and all of the other work that's going on in our field, um, can we evalu evaluate novel therapies um, in just mouse models, kind of preclinical studies before um, Meg starts the trials on patients, um, to improve on current therapies and hopefully prevent or at least delay um, resistance to imatinib? So this is where um, my work has been focused. I showed you guys last year, and we published a paper last year. I'm sorry, it's hard to see up here. Um, against the purple background. But we identified um, a few um, markers that we believe are markers of imatinib response. Um, two of them that are listed here are periostin and TGF-beta-3. And so my efforts over the last year have been to um, try to validate these in larger pa uh, patient samples, different types of patient samples that we have access to, and then to, um, to validate them. So one way of validating these markers of response is, as Marty was mentioning with those ELISA studies, to look at the levels of these markers that we identified and to see if the levels are elevated in those patients that respond or do not respond to therapy. Um, so we were able to actually validate in about 86 just um, serum samples elevated levels of, those, of two of the markers that we had identified in the previous study. And so what this means is we basically looked at clinical data that we were able to gather from patients, and we kind of set a 12-month cutoff. Um, patients who stopped responding at that 12-month or earlier, we called non-responders, and patients who continued on with Gleevec successfully for more than a year were called responders. And we just looked at the protein levels in the bloods from these two groups of patients, responders versus non-responders, and we found significantly, statistically, which is important, statistically significant differences between the non-responders and the responders in two of these markers. And so our hope is in the future to be able to get secondary validation sets um, in order to be able to validate this from outside of um, Fox Chase uh, samples. So that was a huge resource for us. Our um, biosample repository here um, really, really helps with you know, getting samples for us to do the research on. 
Um, another resource of the biosample repository is not only the blood samples that we get from just patients, but also their tumor tissue, which is another way of that, um, kind of a secondary way. And so we can perform what's called IHC, basically taking antibodies and looking at the levels of these markers within the tumor. So before we were talking about in blood, here we're talking about in the tumor. And recently, over the last few months, we've been fortunate enough here at Fox Chase to um, purchase in our re repository um, this really great microscope called Vector2, um, which allows for kind of high throughput, um, automated um, and blinded scoring of these tumor samples, where we can look at you know, hundreds of tumor samples with a microscope that can look at the cellular level within a tumor and be able to look for um, levels of these markers. And so it's a really neat system. We're able to tell the microscope what tumor should look like, what normal should look like. Um, and then basically the microscope can, at a cell-by-cell -cell level, score expression of these markers that we're looking at. And we get basically this number back that tells us what the levels are inside of these tumors um, at the cellular level. So this is something we're taking advantage of. I just kind of put, oops, sorry. Went the wrong way here. Um, I put some numbers up here so you can see that within a single tumor, there are different levels within each cell. And we can see cell by cell within the tumor um, some cells that are purple, that are negative and don't have expression of the marker, some that are yellow, and that means they have low expression, some that are orange, which have higher, and we're missing the kind of the third category or the fourth category, which is bright red, which have high expression. And so we can get a number, a numerical value which tells us the levels of um, these markers inside of our tumor. So this is what I'm working on now um, to kind of combine it with those serum or those blood studies to see if we truly have markers of response. Any questions on that before I move on to the next section? We're OK? Good. OK, so as I mentioned, the other place we'd like to go because our GIST lab is translational, um, we like to kind of as we get hints towards novel targets, we like to evaluate those targets within a just mouse model. And so we use a xenograft model of mice where we have kind of immunocompromised. The mice um, immune system is compromised. So we can inject um, within the mice just cell lines and form tumors that kind of stick out of the mice and they're easy to measure. And we can evaluate new therapies. So our group and many others have published over the last couple of years um, an observation that when GIST tumors, GIST mutant tumors, um, start to become resistant, they have elevated levels of, or activated levels of a protein called AKT. And so what we wanted to do is assess whether we could inhibit AKT in combination with Gleevec to see if we could improve um, on tumor response to these agents and um, potentially delay resistance. And so we've um, done one large study um, which we've completed, and I'll just kind of show you these um, asterisk groups where we have group one, which is just no treatment. They've ba basically been given water instead of any active drug. Um, we have a group that has just Gleevec, a group that has the AKT inhibitor, and then finally the combination group, which has both Gleevec and the AKT inhibitor, and this is all in mice. They take um, the drugs orally. They're dosed at different schedules depending on what the pharmaceutical companies recommend. Um, the tumors are measured using this apparatus here called a caliper, which basically measures the tumor volume. We take a uh, width and length measurement. And at the end of treatment, we can kind of harvest the tumors and we can do a lot of um, you know, molecular analyses that I've talked about before, staining with IHC and others, um, in order to look at um, whether or not these agents, Gleevec and the AKT inhibitor, are um, working the way that they should be. So this was the, these were the results from our first study, um, which showed basically the vehicle, which is this blue line where you can see kind of continuous tumor growth. growth. Um, Amatinib and the AKT inhibitor showed um, a tumor slowing and shrinkage, somewhat of shrinkage, um, here compared to the vehicle. But what really kind of stood out the most is that that combination of hitting the tumors with the matinib and the AKT inhibitor simultaneously at the beginning um, really kept the tumors in check. Um, either some of them um, remained stable and didn't grow, but many of them actually showed shrinkage here with that combination approach. 
And this is something that we could look at when we took the tumors out of the mice at the end of the study. We could do um, tumor weights and see that that group five had the smallest sized um, tumors um, and also tumor volumes were lower compared to everything else. And this was all statistically significant. So we wanted to validate this. We needed to do another study before we could move forward with thinking about um, you know, moving this combination um, potentially into the clinic. And so we have one um, study now ongoing where we're looking at those same treatment arms, as I mentioned, no treatment, Gleevec, AKT inhibitor, or the combination. Um, this is ongoing, so I don't have um, kind of the final results. Um, but basically, we're seeing very impressive results with um, the combination of imatinib plus the AKT inhibitor. This is overall survival. And so you can see the vehicle, um, many of the mice um, succumbed um, around 60 days. Um, there was an advantage to having a matnib and the AKT inhibitor compared to the vehicle, but where we really saw um, kind of the impressive results was with that combination, where the mice were living much longer with their tumors. Many of the tumors were shrinking. So this is something that I hope we'll be able to compile the data, and I hope it will um, you know, provide some evidence to examine this potentially um, in um, the clinical setting. And so with that, I'll just kind of summarize what I explained to you, both serum studies and that automated IHC quantification can be promising tools that we're kind of investigating to identify and validate markers of a matinib response. Um, inhibition of KIT and AKT has shown some promise, although it's in the mouse model, um, in suppressing GIST growth and delaying resistance. And again, thank you very much for your continued support. If you have questions, I'll take them. And then if not, please feel free to see any one of us at the, you know, while we're having cake and ask any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, Martin, Meg. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Tanya. She's going to come up and give us a few ex encouraging and exhorting words to carry us on for this coming year. Tanya. Hi, everyone. Um, it's always nice to come back home, so to speak. Uh, between, of course, Meg, well, I'm being very prejudiced because she happens to be my oncologist, but also because she became a friend of mine, and Laurie and Mari and, of course, Monica, Davy. I don't even know where she's sitting right now. Hi, baby. Uh, Bob, thank you for the introduction. James, thanks for coming. Um, and all of you that you are here, it's always nice to see uh, very familiar faces because that means one thing. It means that today is a great day for us. Unfortunately, sometimes I'm not that happy to see new people, but on the other coin is that I'm glad to see them if they knew to be here because they put them in the right hands in the right facility and surrounded by great people they know what they're doing and that's what we need to know that's our security blanket as far as the uh, just cancer research fund you know we are very humbled all the time and are very grateful for any help that we get from people like us, like for instance, Cass, my friend Cass and Charlie Roberts, who they actually had the event last year and it was a very successful event. And uh, that is the Just Cancer Research Fund, as well as Julie, who is, has been on our side now for quite a few years. And of course, unfortunately, her dad passed away and lost his battle to Just. So, the thing about it is that the unfortunate thing is that even though we are trying to progress and move forward as far as the funding is concerned, it's been coming a very big challenge. As you all know, and I don't have to tell you that the American, uh, America stand to cancer and uh, the government, of course, not really funding the rare form of cancer is it's 
one thing that it really goes against me personally on a personal note. Secondly, of course, you know, it is not that great when you are pouring your heart out when you're talking to big corporations, companies, uh, media, political arena, and you're pouring your heart out, not only, uh, you know, as a chairperson, but of course as a cancer patient. And you get the five minutes when you know that the people that you're talking on the phone are going to hang up the phone on a very diplomatic no uh, note and basically not even remember who you were. On that note, I really, really, really am trying very desperately to instill in all of you, in all of us, because what you're looking here is basically the support that we give to many facilities with the help of yours. That couldn't possibly happen. We couldn't do it alone. And as you know, it's very difficult. But I'm trying to instill in all of us uh, the family of just patients and care caregivers and families that not only that we have to put our mindset to encourage conversation but bring just to the surface much more often than we do because it will come a time and a day when you're actually not going to know who you're speaking with you're not going to know that the person that you are talking to might know somebody else that might be able to help with just and reach out to help. Because as, as far, we have not been able to crack through a lot of doors and we need to do so. Because a lot of us are fortunate to survive it as far, a lot of them are battling as far, and unfortunately we've lost a lot of loved ones uh, with such courage and integrity to this cancer. And we don't wanna and we want actually to make sure that they, their loss was not in vain. So with that said, you know, we have for all these years, of course, supported more than one facility, not only Fax, Fax Chase Cancer Center, but other facilities as well. And as you probably already heard from, from Meg and from Lori and from Marty, Every researchers from other facilities are actually work very collaboratively because this is something that is for all of us. We need to reach, uh, we need to reach the goal. We need to reach uh, the possibilities of a cure. We need to hear Eureka from some 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 part of the facilities and lab that we got it. You know, and it's very important for most. The population now that they don't realize how important it is that through a very rare form of cancers, we will be able to make sure that other cancer, known cancer, will benefit from all that we're going to bring to the surface and to bring a cure because of the fact that we're doing such a complicated research on these molecule targeting therapies and it, there are so many facets to this particular cancer. It's so complicated that that I think for the most part you all probably have now kind of understood what from one thing it then becomes ten other things that we need to look into it. From one exon that we knew at one time we have so many other exons. From the mutation not being actually you know not being really looked into and now we're looking into how to deal with our immune system so that it's, it makes it easier for us. Uh, we're looking at so many other kind of different kind of, um, you know, collaborations and different drugs and things to just make it there, to make it happen. We couldn't do this by ourselves. And to tell you the truth, we have to make on our mind that that's not enough what we do. We need to do more. Because the people that you have heard today, Meg and Laurie and, and, and Marty, they basically, their chains are, are just, you know, there <coughs> because they cannot do anything unless we provide the help and the support. So 
we have a lot of events and we have um, a lot of events not only in this country but of course you all know internationally and we're trying to do our best and on the treasure side of it you know my husband Robert could tell you more about that and of course you better have that check <laughs> or we we won't let you talk you know so again I want to thank everyone for being here and um, I'm always here if anyone ever wants to reach out to me um, my private number my emails my uh, organization number you could reach me day and night actually at the middle of the night I'm very accustomed to because people from out of the country don't realize the the change of time so you could call me anytime <laughs> so thank you for being here and supporting us thank you she's a hard act to follow so now I'm going to I'm the treasurer of the just cancer research fund we've been doing this it's it's either 12 or 13 years already and uh, we've raised over seven million dollars over the last 12 or 13 years and so on down the line. For those of you who have recently encountered GIST, and Tanya is a 13, she's been on Glivic for 13 and a half years. She's had GIST for about 14 years, so that's, that is an inspiration and encouraging you know, to, to other people. As far as uh, we go, we run a big walk in New York every year. Dr. Drucker was here one year. He's the man that invented, or uh, invented is the right word? He developed, okay, he developed Glivic. He came to the walk from, from, from Portland, Oregon, and the picture is, is of him and uh, Wolf Frazier, the famous Nick basketball player. That's number one. Number two, we have a bunch of ladies in California, I believe, who have, they're, they're professional quilters who have designed and, and done this quilt that's 92 by 92 to raise money for, uh, for GIST. The tickets are five dollars each, or three for ten. The drawing will be at the walk, which will take place October fifth in New York, in Congress, New York, and uh, all the major GIST researchers in the country comes comes to this walk. We get uh, Chris Callis from Portland, Oregon. We get uh, Ron Di Matteo from uh, Sloan Kettering, Jonathan Fletcher from Brigham Women's Hospital. Meg Van Muren from Fox Chase. She no, she has. And Laurie and Mar uh, Laurie and Mar Tanya. I, I, did I interrupt you? <laughs> <laughs> they they travel. They have been traveling. As a matter of fact, Meg came when she was pregnant. Even she came to the walks. So she's been coming to the walks. I would say for about twelve years. Laurie and Marty have been coming for at least ten years or whatever it is, and so on. And it's you know it's hard to. So it's a big event. Now, I also have to say one other thing, too. Last year, I got up here, and I said that in order for us to raise money, we need, well, I'll tell you the truth. This year, we had more contributors, but less money. We had a lot more people sending in money. Somebody had sent in $100, sent in 50 whatever, and, and so on. So we, we had a lot more contributors, but we raised less money, which, after all the hard work and effort, it didn't sit too well with us, so we're gonna try a little harder this year. Uh, we would appreciate it if some of you could come to the walk. Last year I, I asked for help and I stood up here and I said we need more people to run events and so on down the line. And uh, there's two people here that one lady came running over to me afterwards. She says, I want to help. And she did an event in New Jersey this year. I went to the event with Tanya. Julie was there too. And she, she didn't have a clue to what she was doing, and she raised over $20,000. <laughs> and it's... it's Cass, right? Cass, you and Charlie, come on up here for a minute anyway. Both of you. <laughs> we, we could use... I could use 20 more people like her and so on down the line, but, but her and Charlie, okay, I'm sorry. And so basically that's where I'm going now. <clears throat> we have a board of directors, Julie is one of the directors, uh, Tanya, myself, and so on down the line. But without people's help like, like Cass, 
and Charlie. We, we wouldn't be able to do what we're doing. So anyway, to make a long story short and a short story long, it's a little less than last year, but we have a check for $100,000 for Meg and Marty and Lori for the, for the lab. Come on up here and let's present you with the check. Now, we, we have a schedule also. Next week, we have to go to uh, Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston. After that, we're doing Sloan Kettering. And after that, we have to go to Portland, Oregon. And we're giving them all money and so on down the line. So we'd like to rate, one year we hit a million dollars. We'd like to try and do it again, but it's been quite difficult. Uh, Tanya and Julie, come on up here. You're part of this too. <laughs> so we want to take pictures with presenting the check to you guys. Everybody Cass's, Cass's money is part of this money, so I just want you to know she did a, one, one great job. You got into my head. <laughs> That's right. So if there's anybody else in the future that wants to help us or anything else, we're more than open or anything else, or if you want to help, if you live in New Jersey and you want to help Cass, just talk to her. If Julie's planning on doing another event like she did with Just Ball, maybe next year because she didn't get enough responses this year so she sort of packed it in but she's going to try again next year I hope so but she could use help a lot of help and so on down the line and I guess I'm finished speaking because but that's it if you can come to the walk this year it's October 5th it's in Congress New York and if Meg could do it you guys could do it if Meg could do it when she was pregnant you guys could do it too it's a beautiful it's, day it, it's really inspiring actually yes so, and usually, usually we get between five and six hundred caregivers and patients. And we serve, by the way, we serve a free lunch in the park too. So, and that's basically it. So take your pictures, and we're finished. I'm finished. Okay. And maybe we could take also a picture of everybody Is it possible to take a picture with everybody that's here? Well, so I, I want to tell you something else. You know, over the, over the years, because I'm going to, when I, a couple of years ago when I, we did Sloan Kettering, I made a remark because Sloan Kettering sends, uh, they send a newspaper and a thing and everything. And every year, when you get the newspaper and the thing, they always show people presenting money, but they're always, the woman, the lady is wearing a big gown. The man is wearing a tuxedo, and those are the people that get in the pictures. We've never been in the pictures yet, yeah, and we've given Sloan Kettering over a million dollars. In, in the, yeah. Well, now also I think uh, one of the doctors announced that we gave nine hundred eighty-five thousand. Now it's it's over a million dollars that we've given to this institution. So that's it, and it's it's been a lot of work. <laughs>